Scaling Up Nation, there are so many things to worry about in today's economy. We are not thinking about insurance. And you know what? That's okay. I know it's okay because when I thought about insurance, I chose the best and that was McGowan Insurance. And I know they are thinking about my insurance. When I'm concerned about how much our raw materials are costing, or even if we can find those raw materials and get them shipped to our facilities, and worrying about all of the things that we have to do in this current economy, I can rest easy because they are thinking about me and making sure that I have the best insurance for my company. I get phone calls from McGowan letting me know that I need to do something different. Does this sound like the relationship that you have with your insurance carrier? If it doesn't, trust me, you are too busy to worry about insurance. Find somebody you can trust like McGowan Insurance. To find out more about McGowan Insurance, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash McGowan. That's M-C-G-O-W-A-N. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, your host for the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And wow, how awesome was it to see all of you last week at the Association of Water Technologies Convention in Vancouver. Nation, I absolutely love those shows. It's the favorite one that I go to each and every year. And I love it because there's always so many members of the Scaling Up Nation. Thank you for all of you that came up to me, said hi, told me something about the podcast. I can't tell you how much that means to me because when you do that, I know that my Southern voice here in Atlanta, Georgia, recording on this microphone in my studio is being listened to. Of course, I'm just all by myself here when I'm recording, but you're listening to it. And more importantly, you're doing something with the information that we have on this podcast, with all the things that you're learning from either me or the guests or all the information that we put on our show notes page. And of course, when you're doing this alone in your studio, you always wonder, is this going to reach the audience that you hope it will? And will they be able to take from it what you hope they can take? And I love it when you confirm, yes, the Scaling Up H2O podcast is something valuable as a professional water treater. And so many people say that they use it daily to help inspire them, to help teach them, to help get them to do new things. And then so many of you came up and you shared with me about a particular achievement that you've made. So many people are getting certified now. People are going out for higher positions in their companies. They're going after business they might not have stopped at before because they felt like they didn't know enough. They didn't have enough experience. But they got over that. They had the desire. And now they're forcing themselves to learn even more. And they are helping customers. I love all of those stories. And I can tell you dozens of them. I just want to say thank you. Nation, as always, make sure you're checking the calendar for all the things that are coming up. I had several people tell me that they would not have known about the AWT conference had it not been for this podcast. So, and that's part of my job. I'm trying to keep you in the know about all of the things that are coming up. And we are tracking those not only weekly on the podcast, we're also making sure that you have a way to get that information easily. And when I said we're tracking them on the podcast, what I really meant to say is they're on our show notes page, but maybe you don't remember what episode I was talking about a particular event. 
Well, that's fine because the great staff here at the Scaling Up H2O podcast have solved that as well. And you can now simply go to the events section on our webpage. Trace, what is that webpage? I'm so glad you asked. It's scalinguph2o.com. You go there and you are able to look at all of the events that I've mentioned and all of the events I might not have even talked about yet. You can see what's going on in the calendar and you can make a calendar invite right there by clicking on the link so you can get that in your schedule so you can plan on that. And I had several people thank me for doing that because it made the AWT conference so much easier for them to attend. Again, that is not just me. That is a group effort with all of the fine folks here at the Scaling Up H2O podcast. But again, once again, thank you for sharing that you're actually using all of these tools because we don't know if you don't tell us and so many of you told us last week. Since I'm talking about things that need to be on your calendar, the International Desalination Association is having their conference October 9th through 13th in Sydney, Australia. So if you're in that type of water treatment, by all means, go to our show notes page, check that out, see if it's something that you should attend. And these days, there's so many virtual options and conferences have realized that if they offer lower price points and give you access to some of the material that's there, now you're not going to get everything at some of those lower price points, but you might get just enough for you to get more knowledgeable on a particular topic. I'm not saying that the International Desalination Association has definitely done this, but I've seen this with so many associations. So don't think if you can't go to Sydney, Australia, that you cannot attend this. There might be another way. So look into it if this is something that interests you. Also, the American Water Resource Association is having their conference in Seattle, Washington, November 7th to 9th. This conference is all about water resource management. The American Water Resource Association provides you with practical, innovative, and applied water resource management solutions, also management techniques, and access to all their current research. If you want to learn more about this particular conference, go to our show notes page and we'll have all of that laid out for you. And then the last thing I'll talk about is the UN Water Summit on Groundwater. This is going to be in Paris, France. Please call me and tell me you want me to cover this. I would love to go to Paris, France. That's going to be December 7th through December 8th. And this is all about bringing attention to groundwater at an international level. If this is something that interests you, please go to our show notes page. We will have all of that information. Before I get into our guest, I want to give a shout out to all the listeners we have in Ecuador. I have to tell you, this guy that's sitting in his studio all by himself making this recording had no idea that when I started this podcast five years ago, we would have well, any listeners, honestly, I was hoping that we would just have a couple dozen people listen to me. Now we have thousands of people that are listening to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And the fact that we are worldwide is just blowing my mind. So here's a statistic in Ecuador. And thank you for all the listeners we have in Ecuador. We rank 91 out of all the podcasts listened to in that country. And we're number 15 in educational podcasts. That is just phenomenal. Now, here's why I'm really excited about this. And I think you know this because I've talked about this before. 
But I, Trace Blackmore, absolutely love water. And one of the things that I do in water is I scuba dive. So my job is treating water. My hobby is diving underneath the water. And folks, if you have not done this before, you are missing out on the most amazing world. We're not meant to breathe underwater. So the fact that we have the technology that we can do this and we can see so many amazing things underwater, it is just fantastic. I highly recommend it. I'm a scuba dive instructor. I have taught hundreds of people how to breathe underwater safely, how to respect that environment. And it's one of my favorite things to do. And I also have a bucket list when it comes to places that I want to scuba dive. And the Galapagos Islands are definitely on that list. So Ecuador, I am coming to see you someday. I don't know when it is. My wife, my new son, Hayden, we are all looking forward to coming down to see you and see that amazing underwater world that you have. So I don't know when we're going to do it, but I will make sure to talk about it on the podcast. Speaking about things that we need to talk about on the podcast, let's go ahead and get to our guest. Nation, you are going to hear from a person that I consider a friend and a mentor, and you're going to see why as we have this interview. I hope you enjoy it. My lab partner today is Chuck Hamrick Jr. of Eagle Consulting. Chuck, I'm so excited to have you on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Welcome to the show. Well, Trace, thank you very much. I look forward to being with you. Chuck, you and I have a long history. I think we first met on my first day as a board member for the AWT. You were president of the AWT. And geez, how long ago was that? What? How many years? That must have been around 2003 or four when you came on, because my presidency was uh, 2007. And then I was media pre past president uh, in 2008 and off the board enjoying life from 2009 to the present. Yes, there's always off the board and all the things you get to do after being on the board. But I would say it's probably one of the most rewarding things that I've done in my career. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. I would totally agree with that. I learned a lot during that time. There was a lot of super great guys on the board when I was there that actually helped me, such as Bruce Ketrick uh, Sr., uh, Bill Pearson, uh, Jay Farmery, and just numerous other guys. Uh, it was a great time to be on the board, uh, and you as well, coming on with a lot of great ideas, uh, your first and second year there That while I was on the board, and uh, just a great time. Well, I remember I was a bull in a china shop, so you tolerated me very well. Thank you for that. Well, you know, we're all that way at first, and, uh, you know, I'm just uh, so proud of how you turn things around and become super successful and, and uh, uh, being in the AWT board and then also your career. It's just really neat to see the younger generation doing such a great job. And Chuck, I love you so much more because you just called me young. That doesn't happen very often. So thank you. <laughs> well, when you're 63, you know, Anything in the 40s is considered young. <laughs> well, Chuck, I, I can't wait to get to this entire interview. I know the Scaling Up Nation is going to appreciate you as much as I do. But before we do that, do you mind sharing with the Scaling Up Nation a bit about yourself? Yes. Uh, I'm a husband uh, to my lovely wife, Vera, who has almost been 42 years on August the 30th of this year. It'll be 42 years of marriage. I'm the father of three wonderful, fantastic, obeying children, uh, my daughter, Abby, and my son, Chase, who's in the water treatment business with us, and my youngest daughter, Adrian. I'm the grandfather of 10 beautiful grandchildren, Hunter, Lori, Nolan, Aria, Talia, Wyatt, Caroline, Linya, Athea, and Cade. I'm the owner of a water treatment company called Eagle Engineering Water Technology, and as you mentioned, I'm past president and board member of AWT. With all that, life is very good. And a heck of a nice guy. 
Uh, some people say that. <laughs> well, I got to say, Chuck, through through all the years that I've known you, uh, you are a man of faith, and that is the foundation of everything that you do. And that's just so refreshing to see. And and it's just uh, it's just great that you always know where you're coming from, uh, and you always know where you're getting that from. So I, I want to thank you for for just demonstrating that to the world. Well, thank you, Trace. I try to do my best. Uh... We're all uh, creatures from the Lord, and we uh, should be trying to do what He would have us do. Well, let's shift gears back to AWT. Actually, let's go even further back. I was thinking that was a long time ago, but we can even go further. Uh, So let's talk about when you decided you wanted to get into industrial water treatment. How in the world did you have that thought? Well, Trace, it's kind of a funny story. I was... uh... Uh, I was in the insurance business. I was uh, very successful. I was uh, one of the fastest growing uh, managers in a very large Fortune 500 insurance company. I took the sales in the first nine months I was there and had the largest growth in sales. Then they promoted me to a staff manager where I had nine different sales reps under me. And I was only like 21 at that time. And they were the youngest one was 35, and the oldest one was like my age now, 63. So it was a group of uh, people that uh, had been in their business for a long time, weren't, weren't very motivated to do much more. I was a young, ambitious person that uh, motivated them, and we took the third worst staff in the national corporation to in the top three, and uh, was doing very well. And then I uh, think I had a little issue with uh, my health, and I was in the hospital a few days. You got to remember back then they put you in for a cold. And I was in there, and uh, one of my deacons came to visit me and found out that he's in the water treatment business. And I must have impressed him because I asked him all the type of questions you would love for someone to ask before uh, you knew if they maybe want to be in the water treatment. He told me he sold industrial chemicals, and I said, wow, that's something that they probably have to buy every day or at least once a month, right? And he said, yeah. I said, man, the repeat commission on that has to be great. Then I found out his commission rate and was telling me about some of the product, and I said, wow, I could make a lot of money doing that. And uh, even though I was very happy where I was and uh, didn't think it led to anything, and about a week later, he came back to offer me a job, and I told him I wasn't really interested, but he said, one of the magic things when I was a little kid, I always wanted to be an owner of a business. He said, well, Chuck, if you come to work with me, I'll offer you up to 20% ownership in the company, and uh, you'll be the first choice to buy the company when I retire. And uh, that was probably the motivating factor that I was really excited about, that I, someday I could own my own water treat company or a business. And so I kind of leaped out in faith, uh, took a substantial pay decrease to go to work there, but uh, was really excited about learning uh, how to sell water treatment. I was very good at uh, personal relationships and, and convincing people that we could do the job and so forth, but I had to get the technical knowledge behind that. So, Chuck, obviously it went well, and you did end up purchasing that company. Can you tell us about that? Well, I purchased the company in 2000 and had a um, situation with the past owner uh, where he uh, kind of uh, went against uh, the buyout procedures. And uh, there were several lawsuits that went past uh, through that, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees and so forth. But in 2014, we had all that uh, cleaned up, and we started the what we call the new company, which is Eagle Engineering Water Technology. Uh, pretty much all of our customers that was at the other company uh wanted to come with us, and we took all the ones that we wanted, and the other ones we suggested to go to someone else. But uh, right now, we have a a very successful company, very profitable. Uh, My son is in the company and probably will be taking over the company in the next four to six years. And uh, we've been starting to run a a better management program based on the mastermind group that uh, you lead with Traction. And uh, Gino's company, I believe, or book, uh, Gino Wickman's a book on uh, EOS, the uh, Entrepreneur Operating System. And my son is just doing a tremendous job in that. And uh, we have a great future. 
Well, that sounds amazing. I mean, that's a that's a, a a very condensed version of a very impressive career. Let me ask: lessons learned. Somebody gets a similar job offer that you did, and there's some sort of ownership or buyout arrangement in that job offer. What would you advise them to do based on your experience? Well. I believe they should try to learn as much as they can about how a business actually operates and then to uh, have a, a good system. And hopefully if they're buying out a company, they might already have a good system in, in a lot of ways. But I believe they really need to maybe look at uh, the traction uh, EOS uh, program. It's really helped us. Uh, we haven't been running it very long, but it's actually helped in some of the holes that we weren't quite doing quite right. I guess I would tell them to immediately trying to learn as much as they possibly can of how the business works to get the technical background as well and try to find someone that could be their mentor uh, like I did uh, many years ago. Well, Chuck, something you also mentioned was the AWT. Of course, we started this conversation where that's how you and I met. When you were in business, why did you seek out the AWT? And why did you first become a member? Well, I, I was actually like at one of the first meetings in 1987 at the Pittsburgh Water Conference back then. Now it's the IWC. But uh, so I had great interest. I went to pretty much every conference uh, through the uh, 80s and, and early 90s. I missed a couple during the mid 90s. And then pretty much from 2000 to the present, so I've been to every one of them. So I saw a great opportunity to be a part of a great organization where I could give and at the same time receive. And, you know, it's amazing. I actually probably received way more than I gave, even though, you know, uh, the old thing is once you get on the board, it's only a half an hour uh, or a committee. It's only like a half an hour a month. That's probably not true. But uh, the bottom line is, is that I got a lot more than I uh, gave because I got a lot of wisdom. I got some great friends, as I mentioned earlier, that at any time I can call up and get information if I can't remember it because I'm getting old. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I got some great mentors as well. I consider you one of those mentors. Well, thank you. I, I consider you a, men a mentor as well because uh, you formed the mastermind. And like I said, I, I tend to get uh, great results from that. Chuck, I remember you did a lot to help the initial AWT sales training, and you're always reading, and you turned me on to Jeff Gittimer, which is now one of my favorite sales training people. So many people out there are scared of selling. They think selling is something way more than it really is. How can you alleviate some of the people out there that selling's okay, you don't need to be ashamed of it, and uh, what tips do you have for them? Well, I don't know if I have any uh, tips, but other than, you know, if you read and study, there's a lot of good m m material out there, and every sales process, process is a little different. But one of the things I remember when I first got into in, in, uh, insurance sales, and I got pretty good at it, you know, I would sell three to five policies a day, and the toughest thing when I came into the water treatment, you know, you don't sell uh, three new accounts every day, you know, that just doesn't happen in the water treatment. And a lot of times you might be working with a client for four to eight, maybe even a whole year before you actually get their business. Uh, industrial sales is quite different than uh, insurance type of sales. But, you know, the, one of the things that I learned earlier when I was in, in uh, insurance sales that I carried over to water treatment sales is that a no is just one step closer to a yes. The more no's or what I like to say, throwing mud on the wall, the chances are I'll cover that wall completely with mud, but I'll be making sales in the meantime. So you just need to have a thick skin and not worry about the nose because the nose only gets you closer to a yes. What are your favorite sales training tools? Well, there's been many. One I really like was the Wilson Learning Institute where it gave you the four social styles so that you could read a person real quick you know, when you're in their office and you're meeting so you can know if they're a driver, an expressionist, an amiable. And then uh, as the new one, I can't remember exactly, but we just did a book on the actual uh, one. What What is that with the red, yellow, green? can't remember the name. That was I Said This, You Heard That by Kathleen Edelman. 
So that took it a little more deeper because then you get the actual personalities involved in there and how the people are actually wired. So if you add those two together, you can pretty much look at a person and understand what's going to make them tick, what might make them excited, and what they have to hear to be able to uh, have you close a cell with them. So there's all kinds of things like that. And like I said, I've read so many different sales and management books over the years that uh, something will pop out maybe after we get off of this interview. <laughs> well, if you think about them, send me a note and we'll be sure to put that list on our show notes page. Okay. Chuck, you mentioned EOS, and if anybody listens to the podcast for any length of time, every couple of episodes, EOS always comes up. Why is something like EOS, and maybe we should explain what EOS is, it's an, it's an operating system that you don't have to run a water treatment business on, it's any business, and it gives you kind of a set of parameters on how you run the business, a set of tools on how you run the business. Why do you feel that that's the next step for your company? Well, I think it gives a lot of great organizations from order entry to uh, your CRM, you know, of, of getting your clients, looking for prospects to how you do payroll, how you do uh, accounts receivable and accounts payable. Uh, you get a closeness with all your leaders of your company. Uh, when you have your L10 meetings uh, to make sure things are getting done and what might need to be done in the near future. Um, you end up doing, you know, a one-year plan, a three-year plan, a five-year plan, which, you know, that's just basic business uh, knowledge that everybody knew even 20 or 30 years ago. But uh, EOS tends to highlight it better and organize it better for you. I believe that's what I would consider as EOS. I mean, we do a lot. We did a lot of the same stuff, but it's much more organized now, and more people are accountable because we were able to be, uh, have them to be accountable for what they're responsible for because of that. You mentioned your son Chase, which is also a member of the Mastermind, and he is just fantastic, and he is the heir apparent to your company. and And Chuck, I really have to commend you because you're getting this right. I read an article not too terribly long ago in Inc. Magazine about family-run companies and how they transition. And most of them transitioned unsuccessfully. And the article went on to why that was. And the article stated that in order for a transition to really take place as good as it could, there needed to be a system, and they didn't specifically mention EOS, but something like that you could read in the article, that's what they were referring to. So one, you need a system so you can get things out of people's heads so people are actually following the system. And then two, the transition period takes a minimum three to five years to really be successful. And you mentioned that's that's your plan. That was the exact time frame that you gave. And it went on to interview the people that did not do those things. And they asked them, well, why didn't you have conversations with the current owner or your father or whoever it was? And people said it was just unpleasant. You know, we didn't want to think about something perhaps happening or him not coming to work because we all enjoy him being here. So it was unpleasant. We just didn't talk about it. And then something happened where the person didn't get any training at all. They just had to step into that position because of whatever event happened. And that was about 90% of the businesses that they interviewed just stepped into the position because they were too scared or unpleasant to bring up that conversation. However, the interesting thing about that article was 100% of those people all wished that they could go back to what you're doing right now and do it the way that you and Chase are doing it. So all of that to ask, you and I know that we have uh, a lot of people in the water treatment industry that are trying to think of what is chapter two for their lives. How do they, how do they transition their water treatment business? What advice would you have for them? Well, I think you pretty much hit it. Uh, you know, you need to have a plan of what your exit plan is going to be. And, uh, you know, my plan has been, because my son has been with us for 20 years now, he started young, 
uh, right out of high school uh, while he was going to college and that. And he's been a tremendous asset for us. But, uh, you know, we had certain ways that I ran the business and, uh, and so forth. And we, we got good, but we needed uh, something that would relate to him, but still have a lot of the basic principles that I believed in. And that's where we came up, uh, why we're on the mastermind group, the EOS system. And, uh, very happy we did. My son is, uh, really taking, uh, the ropes and, and, uh, leading the company in a lot of ways and makes me very excited about that. But, you know, I still need to be around for a few years to be able to help him in any way. And then even after four or five years, the plan is I'd probably be like uh, the uh, chairman of the board type of thing and uh, may mostly just uh, help him to run the actual business, not so much in the business, but running of the business and uh, being able to uh, take care of our large uh, corporate co uh, customers that we have. And uh, enjoying life, you know, I'm looking forward to spending more time in the chuck wagon with my lovely wife, Vera, and traveling and, and uh, seeing all the beautiful sights here in America. Well, you brought up the chuck wagon, so you have to tell the Scale It Up Nation what that is. The chuck wagon is my uh, motorhome that uh, I use for a lot of our uh, larger accounts that we have uh, in different states. And uh, typically, uh, one week out of the month, I'll jump in the uh, chuck wagon with my wife, Vera, and uh, we'll go around uh, like a bread route or whatever, uh, servicing these large plants. And, uh, and then at the same time, we do a lot of sightseeing and eat at some nice restaurants and also cook up some nice meals because the chuck wagon is fully loaded. So that's pretty much what the chuck wagon is. Chuck, I got to see the Chuck Wagon firsthand when you drove it down to Atlanta for our first live event. And I have to say, I am so impressed because you've been able to master something that I've always struggled with. I've always either done business or personal, and you have tied the two together so amazingly well. Did you learn to do that or have you always done that? Well, you know, I think you you learn over time, but it, it really comes down to, you know, your game plan, your your ministry. Uh, you know, in my business, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person. I, I study scripture a lot, and, uh, you know, I know how important the family is. So I try to give uh, good respect to my wife and, and to my three children and my grandchildren. I feel family besides God is the most important thing in my life. And then uh, the business and the country uh, would come in third or fourth. So I just try to do what uh, I know my Holy Spirit. You know, it's the old saying of uh, WWJD, uh, uh, what would Jesus do? I try to do those things. And you mentioned your lovely bride, Vera, my lovely bride, Stacy, they always get together at the AWT conventions, and then they go off and do all of these adventures while you and I are in meetings. Not necessarily boring meetings, but they're not the adventures that they are going on. So I know they really enjoy getting together every year. Oh, uh, Vera thinks the world of her wife, and uh, she always looks forward to going on the long walks with her. And because uh, I know your wife, love donuts uh, they always tend to go somewhere that has a good uh, donut place uh, <laughs> they, so they can get some donuts <laughs> they sure do well, well speaking of awt and of course uh you know we were talking about the convention but you've been involved in awt and you've authored a few technical papers how did you even get involved in that well, you know, I didn't think I'd ever be a part of writing a technical paper, but when uh, back at that time, what, the first couple, the first, I think the first year was like uh, 2000 I be, or 2001, I became a technical committee chairman for the AWC. And then I also carried it on one or two years when I was actually on the board, which was not normal at that time. Uh, I understand from Steve Heyer that uh, it is now a little more normal. Uh, but uh, back then, you know, typically if you're on the board, you weren't on a committee then. But uh, at that time, we were trying to get the technical committee to do a lot more and produce a lot more papers, which over the years has really improved. But back then, we didn't get too many papers to uh, white papers and that to present at the AWT convention. So we were trying to get some papers and uh, 
uh, White Rust was one of them, and I helped uh, to write uh, the original one of that, and then the Enhanced Toot Paper was the second one. But I was mostly one that helped organize it, do some research. Pat Sis and Jay Farmery are the ones that uh, did a lot of the actual te- uh, technical part of it, and then I overlooked it and that. But it was fun being in that group, and I think that's why people should really get involved in these type of organizations like the AWT or masterminds or whatever, because you meet some great people and you get to share your talent and then you get to learn from their talent and their mistakes. Well, that's true too. (laughs) Yeah. I love it. And that's what happens in uh, either the AWT or the mastermind. Somebody will say, that's a great issue that you have. I've had that issue. So instead of starting from square one, here's step 10. And you get to learn and improve on their mistakes. Yeah, it's always better to take the ones that work than the ones that didn't. That's right. That's right. And you get you get the benefit of hindsight. So, folks, if you're doing life alone, you're doing it wrong. You know, one, find a mentor. Two, find a group. Find an association, and make sure that you're talking with people because uh, you make too many mistakes on your own that you don't have to make. Very true. Very true, Trace. Chuck, one of the issues that we have as industrial water treaters and specifically owners of industrial water treatment companies is we're always trying to find the next new person to hire. And there are so many colleges out there that may not know that industrial water treatment is an option. We're getting more and more of those students listening to the Scaling Up H2O podcast so for them, what advice, what do you want to tell them about getting involved in this industry? Well, one, I'd like to tell them that it's a very successful business to be in financially and also getting friends and helping people. But uh, I would suggest that they read and study every single white paper you can locate out there like I did in the 80s. Get the AWT training manual and read it cover to cover. And if you don't understand something, ask your your people that uh, run your company. And if not, then I would recommend as well that you uh, get to reading uh, Colin Frame's book on boilers and cooling towers, as well as James McDonald's book, uh, Drop by Drop. I would pick the brain of every water uh, treatment consultant that you had uh, ever met. Uh, give you an example, after about six years into the business, I took on my own, even though I was a small uh, partner of our company that really didn't see any profits or anything at that time. And remember, I said I left the insurance business and took a pretty large pay decrease to get, uh, go into water treatment. But I knew that I wanted to build this business and I wanted to be successful in it. So I looked for the most successful person I could possibly think of by going to the AWC and and the Pittsburgh Water Conferences, and I ran into two gentlemen. One was Paul Pecoria, and the other one was Fred Wilk. Paul Pecoria said worked at Nalco before and a couple other companies and then had his own consulting company. Fred Wilk was one of the original formulators and one of the masterminds of Dearborn Chemical and that. But uh, to give you an example of what I did because I was hungry and I wanted to know how to know this business better, I paid for my own trip to go to Colorado and spend a week with Paul Bacorius and carry his brace case around to different accounts and sitting around his office desk and talking about different formulas and things on my own dime. And it was the best time I ever had in my life learning this business. Uh, I would highly recommend that you might not have to spend the money that I did, which, you know, I had to get a hotel and an airplane ticket there and all that. But uh, there's now with uh, the AWT and so forth, there's many people out there that if you find is a trusted and a knowledgeable person, don't hesitate to go up and talk with them, introduce yourself to them, and to learn from them. They will take you under their wing and lead and teach you whatever you want to know. That is a great story and great advice. And the thing that rings so loud in that story was you were hungry for it. I want to ask you this question, and we're going to sound like a bunch of old people talking now, but do you feel people are that hungry these days? I hate to say it. Uh, I would say no, because, you know, and, and when I say that, it's because everything has changed, too. You can pretty much get anything you want on the Internet now and, and learn things. 
But let's face it, not everything you get off the internet is correct. So you still need to have those personal relationships because, as you said, I'd rather learn from someone else's mistake than my own mistake. It's great advice. Well, Chuck, I could keep you all day. However, I know that we need to transition to the lightning round question. So are you ready for the lightning round? Well, I don't know about that, but yeah, let's give it a go. All right, here we go. If you could go back in time to talk to your former self on your first day as a water treater, what advice would you give? I guess the first thing I would tell myself is, like I was saying earlier, is that to relax, learn as much as you can, because I was pretty hungry at that time, and I was used to making sales. I almost quit after about two months because I felt like I couldn't close sales of industrial water treatment. But it's a process. You have to learn what the business is. you got to learn what the client needs. And then you need to learn how to present it so that you can attract them to want to do business with you. So I, I think that would be the one thing I'd like to tell myself is to relax and trust yourself that eventually you'll be able to do this business right. Chuck, what are some of your favorite books? Well, I actually have more than five, but I'm only going to give you five right now. There's a book I'm reading right now. It's what I consider the number one book. It's The Hour That Changes Everything by uh, Richard Pearson. My second favorite book was Grit by Angela Duckworth. Then, obviously, I like uh, Colin Frayne's Boiler Book and Cooling Book. And then I also uh, really get a lot of good information for the business from uh, James McDonald's uh, Drop by D- Drop. And one of my favorite sales books was Consistently Selling by Weldon Long. And one to grow on is a new book out there by Jack Graham, A Life According to Jesus. We'll make sure to have each of those on our show notes page. You know, you mentioned Angela Duckworth, Grit. Have you seen her TED Talk? Yes, yeah, exactly. I'll make sure to have that link on our show note page as well. Uh, It's just fantastic. And it's like 10 minutes, I think. Yep. Chuck, when somebody writes a movie script about your life, who do you want playing you? Well, because I don't think anybody would ever uh, want to write a movie about me. I probably would consider Bruce Willis because then when I was not as heavy as I am now and when I actually still had hair, a lot of people thought I looked a lot like him back then. So, And plus, he's just a good actor. Well, I'm glad you said it, because every time I watch Die Hard, I say, is that Chuck Hamrick? <laughs> yeah, right. Chuck, my final question. If you could talk to anybody throughout history, who would it be with and why? You know, that's a question that you know would be easy for me to say. And... I'm, the person I'm going to say will not be really the person I really want to talk to, but I know there will be a day that I'll be able to talk to that person, and that would be Jesus. But the person I would say now why I'm still living would be John, the author of the book of Revelation, because uh, I think it would be really nice and timely to be able to know exactly what the future holds for us all. Chuck, this was a lot of fun. Lots of great information. I want to thank you for coming on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And I want to thank you, Trace, for all the hard work you did and the leadership qualities that you have and being a good friend. I appreciate you. Thank you. Chuck, once again, thank you for coming on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. It's hard to believe I've been doing this for five years and you have just gotten on the podcast now. So sorry about that. Nation, I'm sure you can see why I hold Chuck Hamrick Jr. in such high esteem. And I have to tell you, it it was a really funny story that when he found out about the mastermind, He called me and said, why haven't you called me? This sounds like what I have wanted my entire water treatment career. We have so much information available to us now at our fingertips on the internet, all the books that are available, all the resources and people that are available, and the masterminds that are available. 
Chuck said, I definitely want to be a part of that. And he brings so much to the mastermind. And I think a lot of people think with the mastermind, you've got to be either at a particular level in your career, or maybe you're not at the level you need to be, or maybe you're at a higher level than you need to be. Well, folks, I'm going to dispel that right now. If you are doing this job, if you are doing life alone, you're doing it wrong. And there's lots of ways you can correct that, but one of the ways is to join a mastermind. Now, I have one called the Rising Tide Mastermind And you can find out more about that by going to scalinguph2o.com and going over to our mastermind link. And if that sounds good, great. I'd love to talk to you about it. But if that sounds like something that's not really your cup of tea, then by all means, find something else. There's so many things that you can do. But I tell you, when you do this job alone, it's not the same. When you involve others in your successes, in your issues, in helping you learn new things, it changes everything and it makes it more fun. And let's face it, life is too short not to have as much fun as you can have. Speaking of a guy that's having fun every day that he's an industrial water treater, Here's a new Thinking on Water with James. Welcome to Thinking on Water with James, the segment where we don't give you the answers, we give you the topics and questions for you to think about, drop by drop. Now let's get to it. In this week's episode, we're thinking about softening before or after a reverse osmosis unit. What are the advantages and disadvantages of placing a water softener either upstream or downstream of an RO? If placed downstream, how do you keep the RO from scaling up? When feeding antiscalant, how may stroke and speed pump settings impact effectiveness? Does criticality of the RO system impact the design of where the softener is placed? If an RO removes dissolved solids, Why would a water softener even be needed downstream? Are there any reasons to place the water softener upstream that can offset the reduced capital cost of placing it downstream? Take this week to think about whether a water softener should be placed before or after an RO unit. Be sure to follow hashtag TOW22 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O to share your thoughts on each week's thinking on water. I'm James McDonald, and I look forward to learning more from you. So I feel like we're reading Shakespeare here. To soften before or after, that is the question. How'd you guys do in English with Shakespeare? Shakespeare was one of those things that I know people love. I just didn't connect with it. I definitely connected with the sciences, and I guess uh, that goes to a saying that my grandmother used to always say, if somebody didn't like something she made, she never got upset. She would just say, well, if we all like the same thing, we'd run out. And I guess that works with Shakespeare as well. Nation, next week is Industrial Water Week. You have waited an entire year for this to come, and here it is. I hope you are ready to celebrate. I hope you have all of your Industrial Water Week party supplies. You've got your outfits all planned out. You've got the parties planned. You've got the invitation sent. I don't know what you're going to do for Industrial Water Week, but I hope you recognize that you are in one of the best careers out there. At least that's my opinion. And we get to share that together each and every day next week. So that's going to be celebrating pre-treatment on Monday. That's going to be boilers on Tuesday. Wednesday, we're going to talk about cooling On Thursday, it's all about wastewater. And then finally, on Friday, it's about this fantastic job of industrial water treatment. So Friday is about careers. We're going to have a brand new episode for you each and every day next week. We're going to be sharing pictures with each other. So if you're by a water softener on Monday, take a picture of it and hashtag it to IWW2022. 
2022. That stands for International Water Week 2022. But you're just going to hashtag IWW22 of that softener picture or that boiler picture on Tuesday or that cooling tower picture on Wednesday or that DAF system on Thursday or maybe a picture of somebody that inspires you on careers Friday. Whatever you can think of, let's blow this up. Let's make sure that we are all celebrating this together. We realize that even though we might be alone in our cars, like I am in the studio right now, we are not alone. We are members of a community. We are members of the industrial water treatment community. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're a member of the Scaling Up Nation, which is 10,000 plus strong. How cool is that? Share your photos with us. Share your thoughts. Again, that's hashtag IWW22. Nation, I cannot wait until Monday so we can celebrate Industrial Water Week together. Until then, I'll see you Monday, folks. Scout Up Nation, we have just started a new group within the Rising Tide Mastermind. I am so amazed at how successful and how well received the Rising Tide Mastermind has been in our community and we are starting a new waiting list for the next group. If you want to get on this waiting list so you can start with our next group, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind to see if this is the right group for you. And then after you and I have a brief conversation to make sure the group fits for you and you fit for the group, we can get you on that waiting list. I can't wait to talk to you. Remember, scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.